Hello and welcome to our first nation overview for Dominion 6. In this episode we'll be going over Middle Age Elm. This is the nation we played in our tutorial game so I thought it would be prudent to go over it in more depth first. So, Middle Age Ulm is a nation of smiths and heavily armoured clad supermen. Ulm has no farm recruit units, all of their national units that we can see here require a fortress to build. They have weak priests and some low level mages that are quite cheap to recruit in the grand scheme of Dominion 6. They have access to citadels, fortifications that produce 3 commander points per turn, and Ulmish units have higher HP and strength but lower magic resistance than their usual human counterparts. So let's start off with the troops. Looking at War Dogs, War Dogs cost 7 gold, 9 resources, for a size 2 animal with 15 protection and 11 attack skill. They're actually surprisingly good for animals, they're less resource intensive than your troops, and you can actually make a fair amount of them even from the start of the game. Their morale isn't great however, and they're undisciplined, and units that can repel their zero length attack will really screw them over. As animals they have absolutely terrible magic resistance, but they're really good if you just need the numbers. Each does also have an upkeep of 6 gold per year, which we can see here, and it does add up if you have a lot of these. They're, they're not as useful as say wolves for patrolling just because they have that high upkeep for what you get. They can be used as less effective black knights in early expansion, but you cannot script them. Let's go back to the troops. The rest of the troops are all Ulmish troops. So they have that higher HP and strength than other humans, as well as a lower magic resistance. All of Ulm's troops have fairly high protection. So just base, they can be used to expand with fairly little attrition, but that depends on what the independents you're facing are. For your baseline troops, you have the infantry of Ulm. There are six different weapon combos to choose from, and each of six of these variations has a half plate version and a full plate version. The full plate version has higher protection than the half plate version, but slightly more encumbrance due to their armor weight. Two of these six variations are troops with shields. These hammerers cost 32 resources and 10 gold. They cost slightly more resources to recruit than the two handed variants. Out of the two shielded, infantry of Ulms. The hammers do less damage but have slightly higher defense skill, whereas the morning stars that we can see here do slightly more damage but have less defense skill but they do get an additional plus two to their attack skill versus shields. The tower shields that both of these variants carry have pretty high protection and parry values, making them much better against missile units and slightly more protected against foes with similar attack skill to their defense skill. Against foes with far superior attack skill, they'll still likely bypass these shields, but there's still a chance they can come in handy. Do note that these tower shields of Ulm are magical. This makes them much harder to damage or break. Shielded units also have a lower combat speed than the two-handed variants. If you use them, you should use them as an anvil to hold the enemy force, not exactly for their damage. They will be very useful for expanding into crossbow heavy nations, however. The two handed variants of the infantry of Ulm are more offense orientated and each has a niche to, to fill. The battle axes do a lot of slashing damage at 22 and are very good against low protection enemies. The two handed flail variant get two attacks, so they have the highest attack density out of all of the infantry of Ulm, and they also get plus two to their attacks versus enemy with shields. Maul infantry are slightly worse than battle axes, but do do high bludgeoning damage, which is good versus enemies that have slashing or piercing resistance, like some immobile pretenders or the undead. Pikeneers do piercing damage, so better against high protection enemies, and they also have length 5 weapons, giving them the best chance out of all of the infantry of Ulm to repel the enemy. Two-handers are better for expanding in the early game than shield users in my mind, as they cost less resources per infantry and are more offensively powerful. That means you don't need other troops doing the damage, these guys can both tank and do the damage for early expansion. Out of the options, I would recommend using either the battle axes, flails, or the pioneers for expansion purposes. The crossbowmen of Ulm do not actually have a crossbow, rather they have an arbalest. 
Looking at the Arbalest, they fire once every three rounds of combat. These weapons are armor piercing and also have pierce, so they reduce 65% of the enemy's protection. They also have a high base range of 50, and with their precision bonus, they have 12 precision. So they're fairly accurate, but their high range does play against that. These are quite risky to use with your two-handed infantry, as we can see here that they do 15 armor piercing damage. Due to your two-handers' lack of a shield, their protection alone might not be enough to defend them against this amount of damage, and they'll either, either take chip damage and get wounded, or could be killed if they've already been hurt in battle. If you want to use these, then use them with armies of shielded infantry, or chaff screens to keep enemies off them. War dogs are a potential, if expensive, option for this, otherwise utilising summons can also be a good idea. Going to the next troop, the Guardians are a capital-only unit. They are in full plate with 23 protection and have a higher than average attack skill for your nation. They have magic damage weapons with decent length and they have a pretty good morale at morale 14. They also give a castle defense bonus. Each counts as three humans for how long it takes to bring down a fortifications wall. They do cost, however, 46 resources each and are quite high in recruitment points at 31 and a decent gold cost of 20. Their Black Halberd does a lot of damage, though, that is magical damage. So it will bypass a bunch of magical protections, things like Mist Form or Invulnerabilities. The Black Halberd also has an additional effect where it does fatigue damage, but only against gods or sacred units in an area effect of one, which can be highly useful as a sacred countering force. You should use these Guardians a little bit later into your first year, perhaps, maybe going into the second year, if you know that you're going to get rushed or against a nation that relies on its sacred, focus your capital making a lot of these. They are capital only recruitment. Do remember though that they are not sacreds themselves. The next troop that we have are the sappers. Sappers are a high resource and also high recruitment cost crossbowmen. They fire once every two rounds, unlike the arbalists, and they have decent protection for fighting against enemy archer lines. In close combat, they have a pickaxe with surprisingly high damage that is also piercing, but they do have a poor attack skill. Each sapper also gets a siege bonus of 5. These units are really good if you need to crack an enemy fortification quickly, and they are not capital only. However, due to the high recruitment points cost, you're not going to be building many of these at a time. Finally, as our last troop, we have the Black Knight. Black Knights are your heavy cavalry. They have very high protection, both on the rider and also on the mount, but they do cost a lot of resources at 72 and very high recruitment points to make. These heavy cavalry are very effective for raiding and also for expanding with a low amount of units, usually led by a black lord as a commander. They can also be useful in your main armies as attack rear troops. Moving on to the commanders, the spy is the Omish version of a scout. They have plus 60 to their stealth and they have decent map move at 16. They are also spies, so you can get additional information about the province they are in and those next to them. Spies can also be used to increase unrest in the enemy province they are located, and they can infiltrate enemy capitals to get more information about them through the score graph system. Going back to the Commanders of Om, the Commanders of Om come in half plate or full plate variants like the infantry of Om, and they use either a hammer or a morning star. All of these Commanders of Om have 100 leadership, and can lead up to three squads without morale penalties and use advanced formations. Use these commanders as the large troop gatherers for your infantry as their map move is limited. Coming back, we get onto the Black Lords. The Black Lords are your heavy cavalry commanders. They cost a lot of resources at 72 resources each, but with some Black Knights, they can be an effective small expanding or raiding force. If given additional magic items, they can also be used to counter some light thugs. They are also good leaders, the same as the commanders of all. Your black acolytes are quite like independent priests, but they cost less gold and have less upkeep. They need a temple to produce and they are sacred, but they don't really have anything special going on other than that. They only have 10 leadership, so are not very useful for ferrying around troops. And at priest level 1, they're not the best at preaching against dominions. Your Master Smith, on the other hand, is the workhorse mage for this nation. They start off with one fire and two earth pass, and have an additional 20% chance 
for an additional path in either fire, air, earth, or astral. They provide additional resources to the province that they are in, and they also have a forge bonus of two, and they are not affected by drain scales while they are researching. They are also key commanders with 60 leadership for two squads, and they can lead 30 magical units. Going forward into your capital only commanders, your master masons have no magical paths, but they are very effective siegers and castle defenders, acting as if they are 30 men for the purpose of sieging, or 20 for defending a castle. They are also able to improve your fortifications to Citadel thanks to their mason feature, which is something no other commander in Ulm can do. They are, however, terrible leaders, with only leadership 10 able to lead one squad. The Lord Guardians are the capital-only versions of your Guardians as a commander. They have 100 leadership, and they also have the Black Halberds of Ulm. They have pretty decent attack skill with their Black Halberds at 14, and they have an additional 3 awe against enemy sacreds and pretenders. These can be used as anti-sacred thugs if necessary, out of the gate, no gems required. If you kit them out slightly, they're even better at the role, but they are capital-only commander turns for recruitment. Black Priests are Earth-1, Holy-2 mages, with a 20% chance for plus-1 in Fire, Air, Earth, or Astral. They are also Inquisitors, so are more effective for preaching against enemy dominion. They do not, however, have the mundane researcher feature and are affected by drain scales. Niche, but useful in some circumstances. They are able to cast the Ulm national spells like Iron Darts and Blizzard and have a leadership of 50 for up to two squads. Your Priest Smiths, on the other hand, are capped at Fire 1 and Earth 2 with no additional chances for magical paths, but they also are Holy 1. They also have the Unhindered Researcher ability so they are not affected by drain scales, they also give resources to the province they're in, and have a forge bonus of one, which isn't quite as good as your Master Smiths. They can also cast your national spells in Iron Darts and Blizzard. However, they are poor leadership with 20 leadership for one squad. So, now that we've gone over the commanders and the troops, what does Ulm need to work? So Ulm needs resources to make its units. Fortunately, Ulm has forts that produce an additional 25% more resources on top of their administration bonus, which is fantastic. You can get more resources either through getting production scales or by massing many master smiths at a certain location. As far as its troops go, they're usually their recruitment point cost is not that high, except for units such as guardians, sappers, or black knights. For black knights, however, resources will probably still be a limiting factor most of the time, just purely because of their very high resource cost. All of Ulm's troops have great protection, and as such can expand with little attrition from archer fire and normal independent troops. Cavalry lances and crossbows will still be able to hurt them though, so you should take care when fighting those units. Black knights can expand fairly successfully with a black lord and a group of between 5-10 to 10 black knights with very little attrition. Early to mid-game armies should be made up of infantry of Ulm, and either ranged support or black knight support as your damaging units. If you're going to use either your crosswomen of Ulm or your sappers as your ranged attackers, then you should try and pair them with your shielded infantry so you take less friendly fire damage. Crosswomen versus sappers comes down to rate of fire. Sappers do fire more often, but require many more resource points than their arbalesque counterparts. They also do slightly less damage. If you know that you're going up against sacreds, then recruiting some guardians are very useful for dealing with them, especially if they're buffed by your mages. They can be also middlingly useful against some pretenders as well, purely putting them to sleep through attack density, and they also have magical weapons, so if you're fighting against a lot of mist form enemies or thugs, these can be useful for popping it. As I said before, your master smiths are the workhorses of your nation. They will do the majority of your research and forging and will be your combat and buffing mages throughout the game. They have forge bonus of two on a very cheap mage, which makes Alm able to mass produce magical items quite easily. Their astral and their air randoms are both very useful for breaking into those paths, and their fire and earth randoms are also very useful for gaining access to extra combat spells and buffing spells. Your air randoms can be used to make owl quills for one gem with a hammer, 
and also with a little bit of help can start to buff your ranged units as well. Astral randoms allow your nation to start accessing communions either through thaumaturgy research or by using slave and master matrices. This is your mid to late game tactic as your master smiths do not have natural access to high magical paths. Black priests are effective because they can cast Iron Blizzard at Evocation 6. They are also sacred and can receive a bless. Priest smiths are effective because they can cast Iron Blizzard at Evocation 6. They are also sacred and can receive a bless. They can be used as normal combat mages, but their cost to build and the fact that they're capital only means they should be used for more specialized roles. Important research paths for Ulm are Conjuration, Evocation, and Alteration for buffing and combat magic. Construction is also useful to be able to harness more of your forging abilities to make your not-so-great mages and commanders more useful. Construction also has a few buffing paths, as does enchantment. Thaumaturgy has some middling use with Ulm. It does have access to one of their national spells for increasing magical resistance, but it's probably one of the weaker ones just due to Ulm's lack of available sorcery paths. It is very important for Ulm to buff your already good troops with more resistances, protection, or damage through strength, or adding stuns, or giving armor piercing, which massively improves their performance on the battlefield. As far as magic paths go, Ulm's natural paths are limited to Fire 2, Astral 1, Air 1, and Earth 3. They can boost through magical items up to Earth 4 naturally. All other paths and increased paths must be accessed through either independent mages, conjuration, or your pretender. Let's start having a look through the forging items that are important for all. For their naturally available forging items, you have several important ones. The most important will always be Dwarven Hammers, which give you an additional two forging bonus for a total of a minus four gem cost for all of your Master Smiths when forging items which massively increases the amount of items you can make with even the middling gem economy. These do, however, require Earth level 3 in order to forge, so you will need to have either a Master Smith random or create Earth Boots, which allow you to access higher level Earth spells for buffing and damage. Ulm as a nation also gets a 20% reduction for costs for low level items that use Black Steel, such as the Black Steel Sword, Black Steel Helmet, Armor, or Barding. Very useful mainstay items for Ulm at low levels are Braces of Protection, which give the wearer extra two defense skill and two pro extra protection for both their head and their body. For weapons, you can use either Great Swords of Sharpness, which is very useful against enemy thugs, or using a Mace of Eruption, which is good as a cheap and early version of a Firebrand for Black Lords versus Chaff. So, a simple light thugging or raiding build, which costs a grand total of two gems and two mage turns, is a Black Lord with a Bracer of Protection for additional armor and defense skill, and your choice of either this Mace of Eruption or the Great Sword of Sharpness. This only requires Construction 3 to start mass producing, and all of your Master Smiths can craft these. Use the Mace of Eruption with its small area of effect damage for use against normal indie expansion or raiding especially if you have black lords with some additional black knights. Use the Great Sword of Sharpness, however, with its magical attacks and armor piercing if you know you're going up against big monsters or enemies with high protection or mist form slash moss body thugs. For the latter, you can additionally add in a Burning Pearl for an additional one gem for plus four attack skill, which makes them very likely to hit enemies with high defense skills, or blur. A slightly heavier build for your Black Lord would be the Bracers, and then adding in a Charcoal Shield, which gives them more Chaff Clearing ability, and then also a Firebrand, which gives them an Armor Piercing attack with an extra bit of damage and an area effect of 1, which is also Armor Piercing, making it slightly better than the Mace of Eruption for about the same cost. The Firebrand is a quite a late game item, however, as it requires Construction 7. You can also give your mounts for your Black Lords Golden Barding, which gives them Proud Steed, a bit of extra hit points and some fire resistance, for the total cost of two gems. This whole build 
for a heavily equipped Black Lord is a total of one Astral, three Fire, and seven Earth Gems if every item is created by a Master Smith with a Dwarven Hammer. This is still quite costly for a non-mage commander, but it's far cheaper for Ulm than for any other nation. For your troop commanders, you have several leadership buffing items that can be made on the cheap. Helm of the Heroes gives inspiration two to your commanders, which is great for your tanky troops because they'll have higher squad morale and they won't run as easily through morale checks. Additionally, Scepters of Authority are a construction three item that only require fire magic level one to make, so all of your master smiths can make them. These can be useful as they increase your commander's leadership by 50 and also give them access to the spell burn. While this only affects one person, it does make it so that your commanders can actually do something in combat rather than just stand behind their troops. If you wanted your commanders to use something else instead, you could use, for example, a piercer. These are an earth and air cross path, so they will require a master smith with an air random in order to create. You might struggle to do this earlier on, as you might need your air randoms in order to make owl quills. These are very useful, however, as they have high precision and they have armor negating attacks. These will allow your commanders to have some way of defeating enemy thugs with high protection or who you're using mist form or moss body. Later in the game, should you wish, you can also make bows of war for fairly cheap, only one gem in total. And what these will do is they will allow your commanders to spread out a bunch of chaff clearing attacks, firing every round. These are at construction 7 though, so your mileage may vary. For your mages, girdles of might are very very useful. The strength isn't that great, but the 3 invigoration for all mages is fantastic. Additionally, fire in the jar are very good, as if they are made with a hammer and a master smith, they only cost 1 gem. Once given to your commander, they'll now get a temporary fire gem at the start of every single battle, which is amazing economy. You can use these fires in the jar to get a boost with Phoenix Power to allow your usual Master Smiths to reach fire level 2, or your level 2 randoms to get to fire level 3. This will be very useful for being able to access additional buffing or combat spells in the path of fire. As I mentioned slightly before, at construction level 5, you gain access to the Master and the Slave Matrices. These are exceptionally useful for creating communions with all of your Master Smiths, not just the Astral ones. And these will allow you to become a communion nation, although the logistics involved in this are slightly higher than it would be for a nation with easy Astral access. If you can get the paths through boosting, or through your Pretender, or by being able to bid on mercenaries with the required magical paths, you can also get access to the coin of meteoric iron. Giving one of these coins to one of your master smiths with an astral random will allow them to make these coins and also make starshine caps, which can increase your astral path for your master smiths with astral randoms all the way up to astral 3. Additionally, once you've done this, if you would like and you're heavily using communions, having one of your communion masters with one of these master matrices forge a shield of meteoric iron will massively increase the staying power and magic level of your communions. You will however require to get to some additional levels in astral magic for your master smiths to be able to make this. Additionally you have to be careful of the encumbrance so it's a little bit of a trade-off. For research, owl quills are the go-to for this nation. You can create these with any air random master smiths and they can be made for one air gem with a hammer and a master smith to massively increase your research. At level 7 you also get access to lightless lanterns which can supercharge your research further but will taint whoever you put it on. Being able to forge items outside of your national paths vary in their effectiveness. If you have the death pass and the death gems to make them, skull mentors can be a good stopgap before you get to lightless lanterns. However, these are quite expensive and they're hard to make for indies without boosts. If you have a fire and a death cross path, then you want to try and get skulls of fire for the plus one to all fire path boosts for your master smiths. You can also think about building your pretender so you can create any of the level four air or fire boosters 
in order to unlock more spells for your Master Smith randoms to use in combat. Any independent Nature 1 mages are quite useful because they'll be able to sit there and make bags of endless wine, and additionally horns of valor for your commanders, both of which only cost three nature gems if you use a hammer. Also remember to use them to make boots of the long stride for an additional map move, or boots of the messenger, which give even more map move and additional reinvigoration. Very useful for your mages. If you have the nature independent priests as well for creating shaman staffs, which give plus one spell penetration and plus one reinvigoration for whoever holds it. Ulm itself has access to some national spells. In the Evocation branch, they have access to Iron Darts and Iron Blizzard, unlocked at level 3 and 6 Evocation respectively. They both require Earth level 1 and Holy 1 to cast, with Earth being the main path. They both unleash numerous magical bolts, which do magical damage, are armor piercing, and do piercing damage. They also do two times damage against magic beings and count as an iron attack for use against things like spirits. These are an effective counter against magical type thugs or troops, and they also function like small crossbow batteries for every priest smith or black priest you have in an army. At Thaumaturgy level 5, you get access to Tempering of the Will, which is a level 3 earth spell that gives a battle-wide magic resistance buff for friendly units. This can be cast multiple times, but it is magic resistance negates. This is useful in the mid-game onwards for buffing your troops because of their poor magical resistance. They also have access in Conjuration to Sloth of Bears, which is a Nature 2 spell that requires 6 Nature Gems that summons up 15 or more bears depending on the level of the caster an extra one for every extra level. Finally, at Conjuration level 8, they have access to Contact Iron Angel. It is an Earth 5 and Astral 2 spell that summons an anti-sacred flying thug, which is not sacred itself. They can give Ulm a lot of tactical flexibility in the late game due to their flying and being hard to kill for normal troops, as well as the ability to kit them out fairly cheaply with your Master Smiths. They do come in quite late in the research tree, however, and they can really struggle to become super combatants at this stage due to the fact that they are not mages. In terms of good research goals for Middle Age Ulm, you want spells that can buff your troops, give them resistances they don't naturally have, and get some damage spells for you to use. When you have lower area of effects spells, focus on buffing Black Knights where possible, as they will give you the most bang for your buck. Once you have a high area of effect spells or army-wide spells, use those instead. They're great for your normal troops. I'll give you some good examples of spells you want as Middle Age Um, though the order for which you want to go for them will really depend on your in-game situation. Think about which of these spells will be useful for your game and what will help you be victorious against your current threats. So, Conjuration. Conjuration 3 is a fantastic level to get to as Middle Age Um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, for summon earth power. Summon Earth Power is a fantastic spell that gives you plus one to Earth magic and also plus four reinvigoration for the caster and any communion slaves if they're in a communion. Really useful for buffing up your lower level magic master smiths. Summon Lesser Earth Elemental allows you to summon a Lesser Earth Elemental to help you in battle for the cost of one Earth gem each. These can be useful for harder fights if there's a province you need to particularly take or if you're in your first war. Also, from Conjuration level 3, you get Phoenix Power, which is also really good as it allows you, with one Fire Gem, to boost your Master Smiths with their Fire level 1 up to Fire 2, or your Fire Randoms up to Fire level 3. This means you can start using a lot more Fire spells in combat. Construction 3, on the other hand, is very useful, in that it allows you to start constructing lesser magical items. This is what allows you to start forging items for your Black Lords and your Commanders so you can raid and lead your troops more effectively. It also unlocks Owl Quills at level 3 for you to start bootstrapping your research, a very important bit to get to as Middle Age on. Construction also gives you some buffing spells in the Temper Armor Soldiers of Steel variant which increases the protection for your troops. If you use these on your full plate troops for example, they get up to 26 protection 
which will make them take very little damage from normal attacks. Eventually, you're going to want to get to construction level 7 so you can make the best mass producible magic items, things like lightless lanterns and flame brands, but it's very expensive to rush, so you want to choose the right time to do it. When it comes to damaging spells, evocation is your best bet. This is thanks to the availability of your elemental spell paths. You want to get levels 3 and 6 so you can unlock Iron Darts and Iron Blizzard for your capital only priests. Your regular Master Smiths will be able to use Magma Bolts very easily without any buffs. If they want to start using better spells at Evocation level 6, they get Magma Eruption, but they'll probably need to cast Phoenix Pyre in order to be able to cast that. Additionally, those that are buffed by Phoenix Pyre can also start to use things like Fireball and Flaming Fires, especially if you give them some extra Fire Gems to use. At level 7, you can get some access to some really powerful spells. Rain of Stones is very useful on one of your air randoms with some earth boots in that it'll start pelting the whole battlefield with stones. This is later on into the game obviously, but due to the high amounts of protection you'll have through your natural protection from your armor, as well as any buffs that you're giving to your troops in terms of protection from their armor or improving their natural protection, the enemy will take much more damage from this than you will. Only thing to be aware with this is obviously damage to your mages can interrupt spells, and that can be quite annoying. Try and give your guys an air shield so they don't get hit by it. Astral randoms can be very useful for casting things like gifts from heaven in sieges to help you clear out an enemy fortress by throwing a meteor at them. Or when you start communions, you can start to use things like solar rays to help you deal with undead given your weak priests. Alteration, on the other hand, is much better for buffing the staying power of your troops. The group stone skin and iron skin spells massively increase your troops' natural protection and make them very difficult to take down with regular attacks. Later in the game, when you're able to, casting marble army, once you have boosted up one of your earth randoms or given them some other boosters as well, especially using summoning earth power, you'll be able to use marble army. This is an army-wide version of group stone skin, which will massively increase the natural protection of your army. It will give a reduction in cold resistance, but that can be offset by using fire magic for cold resistant warriors or flame flesh army when you get there. Astral randoms are also quite useful in that they can cast body ethereal in an area effect 1, which you can use on units such as black knights to make them ethereal, so they're more useful in sieges because they'll be able to just pass straight through the enemy walls to get to their back lines. Your air randoms with an air gem can also make some of your units have mist form. Good on groups of guardians if you know you're going to be taking on light thugs. Additionally, Curse of Stones is a fantastic earth spell that will, if you have some boosters will make it so that the enemy force takes a lot more fatigue than you so you'll be more likely to win the attritional battle. Enchantment, conversely to alteration, is really good for increasing your troops' ability to kill the enemy. You have multiple buffs for damage, from gifts of giant strength to increase your troop's strength, as well as things such as weapons of sharpness or earth shatter hammers, to give your troops either armor piercing with their piercing and slashing attacks, or with their slashing and blunt attacks, give them a chance to stun the enemy. Which one of these you'll want to use depends on what troops you're using for your particular army. Your fire paths can give your units flame wards or fire fend in order to further increase their fire resistance. You can also start using flaming arrows to buff up your troops once you either have some boosters or you're using gems and phoenix power in order to buff up your master smiths with fire access. Important with them, if you can get independent nature mages, they can be very useful for casting Poison Ward or Serpent's Blessing in order to give your troops some poison resistance. You have no other way of giving this to your troops, so poison will completely tear you up. If you're able to get these guys in, either through independent troops, empowering people, or through your pretender, this will massively increase the resilience of your army. Immaculate Mounts as well is also very good even for nature 1 mages with one nature gem for improving your black knights a lot by making their mounts even better than they were before. Air mages as communion masters or with boosters can really improve your arbalests and crosswomen by using either wind guide 
and greater far flight to improve your accuracy and ranged of your ranged units. Your Arbalists, when buffed by greater far flight, have a very scary 75 range. They can also give some of your Black Knights or Guardians the gift of flight at quite low levels if they use an air gem to help them. This can mean that either your Guardians or your Black Knights are able to fly, very useful in large battles or if you're sieging down a castle. Your Astral Mages get some decent spells as an anti-magic, which will also help boost your troops very per magic resistance. Thaumaturgy, on the other hand, is probably one of the least important research paths other than blood magic, just because you don't really have the sorcerer's paths to use it effectively naturally. Once you have your communion started, though, getting access to things such as soul slay or mind burn can really surprise some super combatants who don't expect you as middle age arm to be able to cast these easily. For your fire randoms, things like Gift of the Furies or Furious Warriors can give your troops additional attack skill, making them much better as well. For your Earth Mages, this is only really useful for things like Iron Will and Tempering the Will in order to increase your unit's magic resistance. You do also in Thaumaturgy get access to the sight searching spells for all the elements, and those can be quite useful once you have the mages and gems to spare so that you can reveal more magical sights for more gem income, given that your mages have lower paths. Lastly, only really research blood magic if you're going to use it. As Middle Age Elm has no national ability to get into blood, I'm going to assume you know what you're doing if you're going for it. Otherwise, it's mostly a dead-end research. Okay, with that, let's go on to Pretender design. So Ohm's Pretender really wants to do at least one of two things. Give them good enough scales for their regular troops to be fielded en masse, and give them access to greater magical paths than they otherwise could get. The great thing about Middle Age Ulm is they love Drain 3. Their main research are not affected by it. In terms of the research point generation, it gives their troops lacking in magic resistance a buff, and gives them an additional 120 design points to use at the start of the game. You can go with magic scales for Ulm for more research, but that will mean sacrificing something else, and you won't really gain that much from it. Because of their strong troops, Ulm doesn't require an Awake Expander like some nations do. But as always, an Awake Expander can accelerate your growth quite significantly. As Ulm lacks any sacreds apart from its few priests, you can build an Awake Expander god with a blessed suited purely for it. But that will mean sacrificing access to magical paths. Dormant Pretender gods are also fine for Ulm of any kind. Titans can be useful as super combatants due to Ulm's forging abilities and the fact that Dwarven Hammers are so easy to make. Ulm has a fairly diverse selection of Titans to choose from as well. Rainbow Pretenders are also okay for Ulm, given that they can greatly increase the number of magical paths available to it, and they're also fairly cheap, allowing them to get decent scales, and they don't require a high dominion to recruit a lot of sacreds. Immobile Pretenders are, in my opinion, probably the worst option for Middle Age Ulm. You can definitely make it work, and they can be very useful, but they don't give you as much magic diversity or the super combatant capability of Titans, especially without research. You also don't need a very high dominion, as you don't need to recruit a lot of sacred troops. And it's difficult to dominion kill you because you have access to Inquisitor Priests with your Black Priests. They do, however, take capital recruitment turns to make, so it is a bit of a trade-off. A pretender that can enter into the sea, or forge items that enable commanders and units to enter the sea, such as using air magic, is very useful for all. They have no natural way with their nation of contesting any sea province. Do note that all of Ulm's troops use iron weapons and armor, so they will be less effective under the water as their gear will rust. If you are going to be sending infantry of Ulm down into the depths, I would recommend Pikeneers, as at least they will take less penalties for fighting underwater due to their piercing weapons. When it comes to scales, as I usually say, I would suggest against taking misfortune. You have enough extra design points from Drain that you shouldn't really need to dump into Misfortune. You also have no need for any kind of Hell Bless, as your Sacreds are really only your Priests. Misfortune is really quite bad in Dominion 6, especially with the new independent attacks that can now roam through provinces. I personally think you're better to keep it at neutral or take luck, but at the end of the day, do what you want. 
Temperature scales massively affect the income for our provinces, so it's usually best not to differ from your baseline nation's preference of zero by more than one or two. Out of heat or cold, I personally think heat is a better option for Ulm. We have access to fire resistance spells thanks to our master smiths, as long as they are being buffed by either fire gems or fire in a jar, so we can better deal with fatigue penalties that we will get. Ulm already has quite bad map movement as well, so adding in an extra snow cost for moving through snowy terrain will already reduce your pretty bad map movement already. This means you'll need more commanders to move around more units, as they're less likely to be able to move more than one province a turn. As Ulm isn't a blood nation, growth isn't really mandatory. Although if you can get blood slaves, they are very nice for being able to make bloodstones. You could maybe even get away with death one in Ulm for some extra points if you really need it for some extra magical paths. But because you're some of your best troops are so recruitment point intensive, that being your black knights, your guardians, and your sappers, it's probably best to leave it at neutral, or if you're going to take death, probably take order just so you get those extra recruitment points. Given that Ulm has no native access to blood, getting blood slaves can be very tricky, even if you brute force it with, say, scouts or non-blood magic commanders, and in that case, you, what you really want is you want growth and you want order to deal with that rest. As for your blesses, the only sacred units Ulm has are its priests. These can benefit from any kind of defensive bless or resistance bless, and they love reinvigoration. Another interesting bless you can take, if we look at the bless list, is Farcaster. This increases the range of all spells cast by bless units by 50% which is quite good for Priestsmiths, as it now increases Iron Blizzard's range to 45 tiles. Another potential you can also attempt is Arcane Finesse. While your Sacreds won't be throwing out many magic-resisting spells, if you use this with Earth Boots on a Priestsmith, you can cast Temper the Wills, and you have a much better chance of increasing your army's magic resistance, as it is a magic resist negate. Blesses will be more useful if you create Shrouds of the Battle Saint a 1 Astral 5 Gem item, which we'll show here. These make your unit blessed, regardless if they are sacred or not. These can be useful for your Master Smiths if you've taken a good caster bless, but they cannot be removed once they've been put on, and they do have lower protection in comparison to your priest's normal hauberks. So only use these if your bless is useful. In terms of your Pretender's magical paths, good paths to get are air, as they improve your ability to get spells to improve your missile troops, through things like Wind Guide and so on. To do this though, you will need to increase the air paths of your mages, and you can do that by either using your commander, getting those higher air mage levels through communions, or through air boosters. At air level 4 and earth level 3, with a pretender design, you'll be able to use earth boots to get to earth level 4, and from then, you can create Staffs of Elemental Mastery, which improve all of your elemental paths by one. When it comes to sorcery paths, Ulm lacks sorcery paths in everything except for Astral. But if your Pretender had, say, at least Earth 2 and Astral 2, then they can forge coins of Meteoric Iron and Skull Shrine Caps, which give your Astral Randoms two different ways of increasing their Astral Power. From there, those same Astral Randoms can start forging all of the other boosters that you need for Astral stuff, massively reducing the gem cost in order to do that. If your Pretender also has Death 1 and at least Fire 1, you can get access to a plus 1 Fire Booster at Construction 7. Alternatively, you could empower one of your Master Smiths to get plus 1 into Death, which will also let you make them, but that's quite costly at 50 gems. Getting this additional plus one fire booster is very useful for your fire random master smiths, as that gives you access at Conjuration 6 to summon a flame spirit, which will then help boost you up into fire magic. Another interesting construction item, if your pretender has glamour and fire, is the Ring of the False Prophet, which increases a priest's holy level by one. This can turn your black priests into Holy Three Inquisitors, suddenly able to Divine Bless your whole army to save on scripting for blessing units, 
and they actually become very effective for reducing enemy dominion no matter how strong it is. Okay, so we've gone through some of the ideas when it comes to making pretenders. Let's go through a couple of example pretenders that I've already made. First of all, we're going to have a little look at an example rainbow pretender. So as a rainbow pretender you can take, you can take a master alchemist with four in fire, air and astral, level three in earth, death, nature and glamour, and level two in water, which gives you a nice spread of paths. In terms of scales, they're still pretty decent. Four dominion, one order, three production, one heat, no growth, one fortune, and three drain. On top of that, you have a pretty decent bless. You're dormant, but that doesn't matter because you have nothing that's incarnate, and it gives all of your bless units farcaster, arcane finesse, poison resistance, three reinvigoration, and two precision, which is actually okay. You can really take any blesses you want. That's the benefit of a rainbow pretender. But I think these blesses are very useful for your sacred mages in order so that they can cast more often with reinvigoration. Their spells are more likely to hit with precision. They can cast further with farcaster. They are easily able to penetrate enemy magic resistance, and they get a little bit of poison resistance, which isn't as easy to get as other things on ult. You could also go for more different types of resistances, like fire, cold, shock, etc. The good thing about this pretender is it will let you create boosters for your master smiths, so they then create their own boosters fairly easily, and gives you access to most conjuring paths for most boosting summon paths. This guy is your classic rainbow pretender. He'll help you with researching. He's great at sight searching. Gives your priest an okay bless. It's not game changing, and he's a powerful spell caster for terms of rituals. He is unfortunately only a human. It's very easy for you to lose him accidentally in a fight. This pretender should really be used as a supporting role where possible, rather than an army killer, at least before you finish forging up a bajillion artifacts for him to use. Use him with rituals, use him for summoning, use him for forging the items you cannot create with your master smiths in order to let them start doing some of the work for him, rather than him having to do everything. For an example, Expansion Pretender, Earth Snake's a classic. He can get you some decent scales, and a fairly strong dominion, and you can either go High Earth Paths, so you can get Hard Skin for your pre own Natural Protection, so they don't have to use Iron Skin within their scripts, or you can go for a Reinvigoration Bless. He's also a good enough expander that he'll help your early expansion quite a lot, and he gives you access to be able to conquer underwater provinces due to the fact that he's amphibious. Not only that, but he can still let you have these decent scales with an Awake Expansion Pretender. So for this example, we've used an Earth 7 Earth Serpent with Hard Skin with 5, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, negative 3 scales. This is a classic expander. If you're okay with some worse scales, you can also take some additional nature magic with the Earth Serpent to give you a little bit more varied path access and the ability to use things like personal regeneration in combat, which makes your Earth Serpent far tankier and potentially a bit more usable in your first war. If you want an Awake Expander with more options later, however, Ulm also has access to the Svartalf Master Smith, who is an interesting choice. He's a dwarf that can shape change into the Lenormer. He has fear while in his Lenormer shape, so he's able to fear expand. And he has decent protection, and also a dragon-based gas attack, and a few good melee attacks on top of that. While he is in this form, however, his magical paths are massively reduced, so do keep that in mind. As an example, I've made one with three in air, fire, and glamour, two in astral death and earth, one in nature, and a three reinvigoration and blur bless. His scales aren't as good as the other gods, at 3 dominion, 0 order, 2 productivity, 1 heat, no growth, no fortune, and minus 3 drain. He will get his original magical paths in his Eldest Dwarf form, and because of his Eldest Dwarf form giving him Master Smith plus 1, meaning that for a while he forges items, he gets an additional plus 1 added on to his magic path level, he can create the boosters you need to get to higher astral paths, to get to higher air paths, to get to higher fire paths, which is very useful. One issue you might have with this god is its lower dominion score, and it's not so great scales. You'll have to use more of your black priests from your capital to counter enemy dominion. The benefits you get from this pretender, though, 
is that he gives you a mix of an expander and a rainbow, but he's not quite as good as the dedicated pretenders of either kind. This kind of tactical flexibility can be very useful still. The Bless is quite useful for expansion, through Blur reducing the chance for him to hit, but it's still more useful for Sacreds later into the game, because they'll also get the Reinvigoration, and the Blur won't really hinder them at all. If anything, it'll just stop them getting hit quite as much if they get put in close combat. As for the Titans, two immediately come to my mind. The first is the new Titan, the Mother of the Storms. You can get some pretty good magical paths on her, and a decent bless with still some decent scales. The one I've made here has four air and astral, three in earth and nature, and one in water, with a reinvigoration of two, bar caster, and poison resistance as a bless. Her scales are three dominion strength, one order, two productivity, one heat, no growth, one fortune, and minus three drain. Again, she does have fairly low dominion, so black priest will be more important in order to keep enemy dominion out. She is, however, a potential super combatant with her air pass later in the game. And she also has a really interesting feature for Middle Age Ulm, in that she adds a sight to your capital from the start of your game. This will mean you have a one air gem income as soon as you start the game as Ulm, which is fantastic. This works really well if you can get an air random master smith sooner rather than later, and as soon as you random one of them, you can immediately start producing quills rather than having to send them out to site search. As a combatant, the Mother of the Storms with this build also gives you access to Foul Vapors as an option, something that Ulm usually can't cast, so it could catch your enemies off guard. She's also able to fly and has storm immunity, so she's able to have a lot of good tactical utility, as well as she has an inbuilt lightning strike as a range attack. So all she really needs is some extra armor to bump up her protection, and she's good to go. If you wanted to have some more utilities for your armies, the Son of the Sea is also an option. For him, I've gone for 5 death, 4 glamour, and 3 in fire and water. And his bless contains a bunch of fire resistances, as well as heroism and inspirational presence. His scales are 3, 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, minus 3. The idea behind the bless was that heroism is useful as it can give your sacreds more XP, which lets them become better researchers, better leaders, and better fighters. You can use shrouds to turn your Ulmish commanders into great leaders with the inspirational presence. They get an innate plus one inspirational and plus 50 leadership, which will also stack with any other magical items you give them. This means that your units will have massively high morale, so they don't rout, and they can easily win an attrition battle. The high death on your pretender means that you can get access to all kinds of death summons and conjuration to help you break into death. The Son of the Sea also gives your troops some much needed tactical flexibility. He himself can lead up to 400 size points of units under the water, because he has Gift of the Water Breathing. This means that you are able to take underwater provinces after your god wakes up, something that Um wouldn't normally be able to do until much later into the game, which can take your opponents off guard. He can also sail, which is fantastic because it means that you can take up to 999 size points along with him across the sea. Fantastic if you want to do a striking attack into enemy provinces that are coastal. In comparison to some of the other titans, he's slightly more lacking in his ability to help you get into magical paths. Most namely, air, where he can make a plus one air booster using the fire and water paths to make a staff of elemental mastery. He won't be able to get you into air quite as easily as some of the other pretenders that I've shown here. If you care less about your fire casting and you'd rather go into air instead, you can take that path and remove the inspirational and fire resistant buffs. And that would be perfectly fine, because that would also allow you to create some air boosters, and also gives your commander some access to things like Wailing Winds and Winds of Death. Finally, as more of an interesting thought experiment, you could take Titan number 3. She has Glamour 6, 4 Fire and Nature, and 2 Water. For her Bless, she's taking a bunch of resistances, and also Obfuscate. Her Dominion is at Strength 4, with 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, negative 3 scales. As a choice, she is interesting because now you have stealth on all of your sacreds, including your Inquisitor Priests. This could be an interesting use case for being able to use stealthy 
the minion killing in your first war, as your opponent will not be expecting you to be able to do that as middle age on. It's not the best idea, as you are requiring on your capital only sacreds in order to do this, but it's a fun thought experiment. She also has access to some good casting and buffing paths that most people won't expect from middle age on. And the fact that your stealthy, super combatant titan can come out of stealth and cast foul vapors could catch somebody very much off guard. Overall, your pretender for middle age on should unlock the areas of the magical paths that you cannot access with your national mages. While still giving you the scales, you need to produce enough of your troops in the early to mid game in order to expand effectively. During the mid game for middle age on, you'll need to rely on your crafted boosters and communions in order to improve your mages enough to start casting the larger army wide spells in order to keep your troops in the game. And with your very limited magical path access, naturally that can be quite of a struggle. Independent mages are therefore very useful for Ulm in order to supplement your magical paths, so you want to be able to expand quickly and get the provinces that you'll be able to use to supplement your weak mage core. As a point, poison is very dangerous for middle age Ulm, as it will bypass all of your unit's protection, at least partially or sometimes totally. You've really got to be worried about spells like Foul Vapors or anything that does large elemental damage as they can destroy a lot of your troops. Additionally, spells that can increase the fatigue or encumbrance of your troops, the things like Curse of Stone or Rigor Mortis, will also make your troops effectively useless on the battlefield. Use your troops while they're still able to be used, and when spells like that start to come out, try and split your troops into multiple groups, rather than taking large death stacks so it's harder for the enemy to get full mage coverage in every fight. Okay, I hope that was useful. Please leave a comment if you would like me to go anything more when it comes to Middle Age on. And until next time, take care.